So it, it, it's sometimes called camera lady, right? Mm -hmm. You got it on? Yes. Huh? Is yes. it on? Yes. Alright, so we continue today. Uh, chapter 7, Demand Estimation. This is basically the statistical side of demand. So, first of all, you have a number of methods uh, related to estimating demand. Number one is direct methods, and number two will be statistical methods. From the statistical methods, you have regression type analysis, and you have time series analysis. From the direct methods, the first and foremost is consumer interviews. With the consumer interviews, they have a whole range of topics, so, so a whole range of ways to do that. One is stop shoppers and talk about them. Another one will be just telephone them home, and when you telephone them home, you simply ask them questions. A third way of doing it is you have a magazine or whatnot. You promise them, for example, a free issue, uh, whatever the magazine is. You give them a nice little card. They fill out whatever they have to fill out, and they return it back. If they return the card filled out, they get a free magazine. So, it's an incentive for one out of 20 people to actually fill it out and return it. So, consumer interviews is actually known, not in the textbook, but better known and everywhere used as consumer surveys. Consumer surveys. Survey simply means that you ask a questionnaire and the consumer will answer the question. All right, so what are the basic problems associated with consumer interviews? The first fundamental problem is that of a representative sample. You can't just get easily a representative uh, sample. That's a problem number one. Uh, back in the old days, there was a legendary uh, survey. It was not a consumer survey, it was a presidential survey. Uh, back in the old days, where a small, only a minority had telephones, they made a uh, telephone call about you know who's going to win the elections, and there was an overwhelming support for the one president who eventually lost big time. What they realized was that. Only a minority had telephones, and the minority was kind of like the rich conservative guys, for example. So, actually, the <coughs> telephone owners were by far not representative. You try seven or eight or nine years ago to make a, a survey on the internet, what you'd realize is the top 10% of the people actually have internet at home will be filling out surveys and 90% of the lower classes of the population won't have internet. So again, uh, if you're trying to use too modern technology, you might be pre-selecting the top 3-5% of society of users of that particular thing, technology, and therefore get an extremely biased uh, sample. Now, response bias uh, means that uh, people that, uh, that keep, uh, when people give you a response to a hypothetical situation, they really don't know the answer. You ask a consumer, I'm going to choose a BMW or a Mercedes, and he would not really know. I mean, he might heard this or that, but when he checks the features, the size, the price of the car, the consumption, the taxes, uh, other features, cruise control, blah, 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 he will realize, and in other words, he will make a very informed decision, and based on an informed decision, he will choose the one over the other. But if you just ask them, given a price, a fixed price, the same price, a BMW 7 Series versus a Mercedes S-Class, he'll just give you one answer or the other. So, sometimes you get these somewhat uninformed responses because you're asking something that the consumer doesn't know. 
But when he really tries to find out, he'll actually have a very informed choice. An example will be, I have it today, a mobile, a Nokia versus Samsung. Or are going to choose this or that, and they'll, they'll just give you an answer. But when you actually start playing around with the one, you start playing around with the other, say, oh, the Nokia is so much better, so much user-friendlier, and at a competitive price. So, uh, in a sense, you have uh, responses which are not well informed. Another type of response bias is associated with the socially correct response. In the Western societies, you know, when you ask the husband how many times you beat your wife, one, two, three, five, or zero, the correct answer is zero. That's it. That's it. Otherwise, of course, it's illegal and you know, I can get in jail and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, these are uh, type of socially correct responses. You ask a drunkard, well, again, that's again in the West, uh, how many, you know, how many shots you have uh, on average weekly? Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen. Well, the, the correct answer is maybe zero or two weekly. You know? He's not, in other words, uh, some of these will be uh, responses of admission of something that might be considered socially unacceptable. And if it's socially unacceptable, there will be a tendency to move and to bias the answer towards the socially acceptable answer. So, you have these type, type of response biases, alright? And then there is one last type of a bias called, uh, again, not in the textbook, called self-selection bias. Self-selection bias occurs because you tried to interview the people, you tried to stop 50 people, and when you tried to stop 50 people, only 20 responded to your questions because they are very interested in it. For example, you try to walk into a Toyota dealership and ask them about BMW, and of course, they're not real fans of BMW, so you will get one type of, of response. Also, you walk in there and out of 30 people, only five will actually bother to give you the response. So, what you might get is people that are really interested in something will actually respond back. Those that are not interested will not respond back. But hearing only from those that responded, you actually hear only from those that are actually interested in the subject. Might be Hollywood movies, right? You ask about horror movies and whatnot, and 95% of people don't care about horror movies. But you can get those teenagers, for example, you're on the street, and uh, you know you stop everyone on the horror movie and asking what not and guess what hundred people will walk by 97 won't give a damn will just pass by you get those three teenagers and say oh yeah so cool great I'll definitely watch and all the good stuff and then your survey says out of the hundred respondents 90 were very excited about the movie <laughs> but these 90 already stopped to respond. They are already extremely biased because they are in the age of 16 to 18 who are into the horror stuff, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but of course most of the 40, 50, 60 year old, they, they never bought it. So, so that's an example of a selection bias. You actually ask 100 people but most of the 40, 50, 60 year old didn't even bother to stop. Same applies for sports, for sweets, like you know, eating for a whole bunch of things. So. Let's see what's else. All right. So the alternative to uh, to those uh, consumer surveys will be a market study or an experiment. So a market study attempts to hold things constant during the study, except the price of the good. An example of a market study will be, uh, for example, I've read details of Gap. The gap, you know, they have the pants, um, male, female. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll hold the prices constant, and in a number of stores, they'll change from the 40 price, lower it to 38. In other stores, to 36. In other stores, to 34, to 30, to 25. 
and then they keep some of most of the stores at a fixed price and they record changes in the quantity demanded driven by the lower price. So this will be an example of a market study. Can you say it again, please? So you have uh, Gap has 100 stores in the United States. Uh, 80 stores, the price remains unchanged. For two stores, you charge a price of two dollars less than the regular. The next two stores, you charge four dollars less than the regular. The next two stores, six dollars less than the regular price. And you simply record the enhancement in sales. In other words, the quantity of sales that went up due to the lowering price. Essentially, what you did is at the same time, you were selling both at 40, 38, 36, 34, 32, and 30, and you're able to estimate. Well, over the next weekend, you're going to rota rotate the same experiment with other 20 stores. Over the third weekend, you're going to rotate over another 20 stores. In other words, what you're trying to do is keep the bulk of the stores constant and only few change at a time. So the others you kind of call a control group and the others will be the experimental group and you actually try to isolate the effect of the price on the quantity of sales. So that will be a, an example of a market study. Another example will be a lab experiment. You get a whole bunch of kids, or uh, it would be usually the, the preferred subject, or experimental subject is uh, students, because the student is always, at least in the United States, always short on cash, and they will always do an experiment for 50 bucks. So you give them the experiment where they trade against each other if it's trading, or you give them token, you give them token uh, cash money like uh, $50 each, you give them a whole bunch of goods and they can go, you know, you recreate like a store, they do first phase spending during the first hour, then they create some, I don't know, price discounts, second phase purchasing, you know, and they create an experiment and within the experiment, the volunteers based on coupons, discounts and other stuff will actually uh, simulate a consumer behavior in the real world. Of course, it's an artificial environment and one has to be very skillful at lab experiments and biases that you typically get in lab experiments in order to isolate and uh, draw proper conclusions. Sometimes what you get is a field experiment. A field experiment is different from a lab experiment because the field experiment deals with the real thing, with the real good and real money. For example, in the United States, the electricity company will provide, instead of plan A, will provide plan B. And plan pricing, plan B will have different pricing for the first 50 kilowatts, you're going to be paying so much for the second 50 kilowatts, you're going to be paying so much for the third 50 kilowatts, you're going to be paying so much, so they're going to give you a different price structure, price schedule according to the kilowatts that you're using, and they tell you this is your price, and you're going to use it, and whatever it is, whatever the real money is, you're actually going to be paying that new pricing schedule and you're using real electricity in your home and you're paying your real money out of your pocket. Well, if this is the case, this is a real field experiment, but they do it only with 100 families. What's the problem with a field experiment like this? Well, simple problem is self-selection bias. They send it to 500 families and out of those 500 families, 300 and say, oh, that plan is no good. We stay with the normal plan, right? The others say, oh, we can change this and that, and if that's the case, then we can choose the plan and lower our costs. So, some people will choose the field experiment because they expect to benefit out of it, and others will choose not to participate in the field experiment. So, this is an example of a, of a self-selection uh, bias 
within the field experiment. Now, another way not to have a self-selection bias is to provide within the field experiment always price reductions and the price reductions are always based on a subsidy. So, if there will be a subsidy on 500 people offered, if they have a guaranteed subsidy, in other words, at any quantity of electricity that they use, they will be certainly paying less. Then, if you have a pure subsidy, then you will have actually people, or everyone will be eager to enroll. In this particular case, you avoid the self-selection bias with a complete pure subsidy. Well, the problem is that the subsidy begins to distort economic behavior in a whole bunch of different ways. In other words, uh, this is not the real price, it's not the market price, it's actually subsidized price. Once you get a subsidized price, a whole bunch of you know, things change. An example of a subsidized price today is Saudi Arabia's gasoline prices, right? You fill up at what? 10 cents, 15 cents a, uh, a gallon. So, the hammer rules the streets over here, right? <laughs> <laughs> the big GMC Yukons and what are these, the Land Cruisers. Of course, the big gas guzzling cars mean nothing because gasoline is very cheap. So, as soon as the subsidy enters the picture, suddenly the, sus the subsidy begins to distort. Wait, we don't have it in Bulgaria. We don't have those Hummers. No one's driving a Hummer. I mean, uh, gasoline prices in Bulgaria are 10 times more expensive than over here. I mean, Hummer will be the ultimate luxury ever in Bulgaria. A Hummer, you know, thousand kilometers of a Hummer will cost in gasoline more than the average Bulgarian salary. So the average person can't even just pay the gasoline of a Hummer if, a Hummer, of a Hummer if he has to actually drive it for 800 kilometers or a thousand kilometers a month. So that's a different problem. Anyway, let's move on and see what's next. Next we move to empirical demand function. The word empirical means from data, based on data, based on observations. Empirical means that you use statistical analysis on data. Sometimes the best way to say it is empirical means based on statistical data analysis. So, you create a demand function. So, you create a demand function, the demand function turns into a demand equation. Then, you make, you know, th this is what is useful for making pricing and production, production decisions. And you must specify a functional form. The two most common, most popular, most widely used forms are the linear and log linear form. The linear form is straightforward, it's simply quantity equals a constant plus constant times the price plus constant times income plus constant times the price of a related product. And you simply make different observations and see what happens. So you could use, uh, let's say, the gap and Levi's. You're trying to estimate the gap. You're seeing what happens from year to year, from, from month to month. You also observe the price of a Levi's, how Levi's responds to your pricing, and you simply make a straightforward estimation. So, this is called the linear form. When you have a linear form, you also have now a uh, difference uh, you also have now uh, the different coefficients give you different marginal values, different marginal values. In other words, B gives you the effect of changing price P on the quantity demand. Uh, it gives you, C gives you the change in income on the quantity demanded. For example, for US 
consumers, if their income increases by 10%, their gasoline consumption increases by 15%, all right? Or if the price of gasoline goes up by 10%, the quantity demanded for gasoline falls by barely one or two percent. So you just see what happens and from there you get elasticities of demand and elasticities of demand are actually the linear form is very attractive because the elasticity of demand to compute is extraordinarily simple. B is the estimated coefficient of this B, all right? And it's simply the elasticity, the price elasticity is simply B times P divided by Q. That's all. Very simple. The elasticity of income is the estimate of the parameter C times M, again the income divided by Q. So, the linear form is loved and everyone enjoys it because it's extremely simple to estimate. It is very straightforward, very simple, and the elasticity is computed in a very elementary manner. And finally, it provides a decent approximation to reality. A decent approximation. All right, let's see what else we have. Oh, you also have nonlinear, and the most popular nonlinear is called the log linear demand function. The log linear demand function is a multiple, so A times B times M times B, again, a multiple of exponents. This is in the explanation, P to the power of B, M to the power of C, P to the power of D. So, it is a multiple of exponents. This function is very easy to linearize, in other words, by taking a log, you're actually converted into a linear form. So, on the left side, Q becomes log of Q. Then, log of A plus the multiple in log form converts to, converts to a sum. So, it becomes B times log of B plus C times log of M plus D times log of PR. So, there it is. L log of A times B ln P times C ln M. So, this one is now estimated in an identical manner. In other words, you take the log of A, the log of every variable, and then you run your regression. And when you run your regression, you see what happens with elasticities. Elasticities turn out to be simply the estimated coefficients. So, in this particular case, B represents the price elasticity. C represents the income elasticity. And D represented the cross price elasticity. Again, the extraordinary simplicity coupled with, coupled with the ease of interpretation in elasticity, it makes this formula extremely popular. Sometimes it's known as constant elasticity of demand function. Constant elasticity of demand because the way it is specified, the elasticity of demand is simply a constant B. All right? Before it depended also on Q and on P. Here it is a constant. So, people again love it because of its extraordinary simplicity. Very easy to use. All right, so, what is the demand for a price setter? In other words, how do we estimate it? Shockingly simple. Step number one, you specify the demand function. Sometimes we call it function specification. Sometimes we call it demand specification. So, specification simply means the choice a functional form. Of course, the preferred choice is either linear or log linear. Usually you'll actually do both and see which one fits the data uh, better. Number two is simply collect the data and you know number three is 
make the estimation. So number two, collect the data. Number three, plug it into a statistical software. The software usually runs it for you in a very simple manner. Uh, in elementary statistics, you should have done this. If not, a specialized course in econometrics will do this uh, for you. Now, the alternative to a regression analysis is a time series analysis. And based on a time series analysis, you can get potentially a time series forecast. So, what is a time series? From lecture number one, this is simply an observation of a particular variable over time. For example, interest rates over the last 24 months, you know, 2.3, 2.4, 2.6, 2.7, or unemployment over the last eight quarters, 6.7%, unemployment 7.2%, 7.1, 7.4. .7. It will be profits, for example, uh, 2.5 million, 2.6 million, 2.8 million, or it could be sales. We call it sometimes, we call it in economics, revenues. So it is simply an observation, a sequence of observations of one particular variable over time. The simplest form is actually a simple linear trend estimation, and based on the linear trend, you get a forecasting. So it is simple as. QT, meaning the quantity of sales, is just a constant plus some linear trend. Let's see if there is, if there is actually, there's got to be a chart coming here. What you do is simply say, okay, this is what the constant is, and we have a constant B, which is multiplied by T. T is simply time. Uh, time, we could use it in different manner. We could use time as year zero, year one, year two, year three, year four. You could use it as 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. It is not very important how you use the scale of T, whether you use zero or 2000, because it will be reflected in the constant A. That's why constant A is not as easy to interpret, depending on how you decided to scale the T. And then how do you decide to scale the T if you have quarterly observations? Do you make it as 1999.25, uh, 1995.50, 1995 1999.75? You know, 25 being the first quarter, 50 being the second quarter, 75 being the third quarter, you know. So you have to figure this one out. That's why it's a, a little tricky to interpret A directly unless you know what is T uh, beforehand. Now, if B is positive, naturally as time rises, QT will rise if B is positive. So. Positive B simply means positive trend of sales. Uh, zero B means that time does not affect sales. In other words, sales are neither rising nor falling. There is no positive trend and there is no negative trend. When B is negative, this means that we are observing a negative trend. Negative trend simply means that over time, the quantity is uh, falling. The next thing to do is to see whether time is a really statistically significant. You simply look at the estimate of B and see if B is statistically significant. If you remember from a statistics course a while ago, B is statistically significant by, or you test for significance with a t-test. If the T value of B is over 2 or 2.5, 2.5 or over 3, then B is statistically significant. In other words, you may possibly get a value of B which is positive, but if it is not statistically significant, then the positive trend is not statistically verified. It is not statistically Reliable. I can pro easily provide a lot of examples to show you uh, this. Let's see. Uh, any questions up to this point? 
No question? Everything's clear? Wow. All right, so this is a little picture. Picture's worth a thousand words. You see 97 observation, 98 observation, 99 to 1,000, etc., etc. So what you see is these dots here represent the actual observations. This line here is properly called the trend line. It shows you what the trend is. You also observe inspection by eye that the deviations from the trend line are fairly small. So, Jay, just by looking at it, you can see that the trend is statistically significant. Of course, the test will simply show it. What you do then is you can use this trend to estimate one, two, three, four years out the sales. And you estimate by the best estimate is the trend line itself. So if you're trying to use 2008, this point right here. If you're trying to use 2009 here. If you're trying to use 2012 will be this. If you're trying to use 2014 will be this. In other words, to forecast from a time series, you establish a particular trend and then you assume that the trend will persist over time. In other words, the trend that was valid from 97 to 2007 will persist from 2007 to 2012. Of course, million things could change in the meantime, but this is based on time series analysis, the best trends or the best estimate that you can get. Now you have more so sophisticated time series analysis like autoregressive models and moving average models or autoregressive integrated moving average models called AR or MA or ARIMA models. Okay, this is a uh, typically a fairly advanced stuff which is reserved for intermediate uh, level statistical courses. Uh, for example, if you are the electricity company, you're not going to be using primitive models like this to estimate the demand of electricity itself. You're going to be using very sophisticated models which uh, adjust for Saturdays as the first day of the week, will adjust for Wednesday night as the last evening of the work week, it will adjust for Friday night and so forth. So it's going to be adjusting for hot weather uh, estimates, for cold weather estimates, for holidays, etc., etc. In other words, the model is going to be very, very complicated. What we're trying to do is something fairly simple. For example, just trying to estimate ice cream and in summer times, here you're guaranteed that weather will be hot how much ice creams can sell and say, hey, uh, you know, last year we were selling 3,000, then 3,200, then 3,500, you know, you're trying to estimate ice cream. Plus, it's not going to be of a strategic importance if you make a little bit of a mistake, you know, you mistook 100 ice creams per day, up or down, no big deal. But if the electricity company miscalculates, could be of, you know, tremendous economic importance. Let's see what we have. So, how is the forecast working? You see the same story. Now, as an example, meaning as an illustration, you could have, you see here, T, 1, 2, 3, 4, 15, it is right here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> If you touch the screen, it goes. <laughs> you touch the screen, it goes up. All right. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you also see what the variations are. And again, this shows what I was explaining a little ago. The forecast for 17 stands right on the trend line. The forecast for 18 stands right on the trend line. You also see the specific quantities beginning at 40 something and ending at 120 something. So you see quantity 46, 56. So this is something like of a demo of how this whole thing is done and it shows you how you estimate the future quantity in we call this 
period. Period 18, period 17, and period 16. All right? It just demonstrates how this is done. Again, this is fairly primitive, and it is not the subject of managerial economics to develop sophisticated uh, types of forecasting models. It is either statistics or econometrics or advanced marketing analysis and research is where you actually get to develop all of these. All I'm just trying to do in one lecture is give you a flavor of the different techniques and what they look like or at least when you read about them that you actually know what it is and how to uh, interpret. So, touch. No. <laughs> no, no, you have to. No. Ah, you gotta tap it twice. <laughs> or you, or you uh, press the, the arrow. Oh, I can the press the this one? Yes. We'll test it in a minute. <laughs> Alright, so seasonal or cyclical variation. What you may have is cyclical variations. I actually teach a lot of cyclical analysis in investments where over certain periods of times you have stock market booms where you know the stock market outperforms overall and then you have a stock market bust where it goes down so cyclical refers to the long-term movements of up and down in the case of the economy cyclical will also refer most likely to economic expansions and also economic contractions so, we call this type of cyclical, we call these business cycles. Business cycles relate to economic expansions, which can last 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10 years. And business contractions, which we call recessions. And you have these types of fluctuations. Now, seasonal refers usually to the seasons of the year where in Bulgaria tourism is very hot on the Black Sea during summertime where the whole Bulgaria you know moves to the Black Sea to vacation during July and August so we have an extremely strong summer season and an almost non-existent winter season on the Black Sea but on our ski resorts in summer times it's slow because everyone's on the Black Sea and during the winter ski resorts are packed really packed so you will have very distinct seasonal variation where in summer prices will skyrocket for rents on the beach and in the winter they're gonna be dirt cheap and everyone's gonna be begging you because uh, during summer they have a vacancy rate of less than 5%, occasionally less than 1%, meaning you can get very difficult a room or an apartment or a hotel during the peak season. It's extremely difficult because, you know, 1 in 100 is empty and it's, of course it's very expensive, while during the off season, that's how we call it, off season, 90% uh, are empty and everyone's begging you and everyone's promising you 50, 60, 70, 80% discount from the price because otherwise the room will stay empty and the revenue will be plain uh, zero. So this is typical example of uh, seasonality. Uh, seasonality, we have a very uh, prominent seasonality in Bulgaria with ice cream during summer ice cream business is flourishing during winter like now people are waiting in snow up to the knee there is no demand for ice cream I mean people demand actually tea and coffee oh, professor, uh, uh -huh. our marketing professor he told us that in the cold in the winter yeah they uh, I mean in America they, they eat ice cream more than in the summer yes that's possible but again uh, this could be a cultural difference mm -hmm. In Bulgaria, nobody eats ice cream. So, it is possible for some cultures, but not for others, all right? I mean, uh, again, that's something that you have to be aware. It could be purely cultural difference. 
You have seasonality, seasonal temperature changes with the four season in both Columbus, Ohio and Sofia, Bulgaria. They are standing identically on the 42nd parallel. Temperatures in the winter and the summer are identical. When I moved from Sofia to Columbus, Ohio, I didn't see any difference in weather whatsoever. I mean, the weather is all the same. And yet, possibly in Bulgaria, no one will touch ice cream and Americans will jump eagerly on it. I, I don't know why. <laughs> it's a whole different story. Maybe that's why Bulgarians are so much slimmer than me. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to uh, where I am. So, uh, what can happen is that unless you properly account for the cycle, you can get an extremely biased estimate. For example, businessmen like real estate businessmen were estimating demand for a new construction based on real estate deals. Well, they were looking growth of 10%, of 11%, of 15%, of 20% over the last four, five, six years, and they did not account for the business cycle that the business cycle will end. Well, the business cycle kind of like ended in 2008. So now they turns out to have started too many construction projects and at the same time, so construction has increased, supply is increasing and at the same time demand is falling due to the credit crisis. Let's just uh, take a note. Today is January 3rd, 2008. Nine, and we count the credit crisis as having started when? August 9, 2007. In other words, we are a year and a half into the credit crisis, but many of these businessmen have actually uh, planned those projects, have gotten financing, have started them two years ago. When you're building a 50-story hotel in Dubai, <laughs> you don't build it in six months, you build it in two years. So. It started like two years ago and now, you know, they're getting it finished, but it's getting hard to sell. And there is one other trick. They were, meaning consumers, were buying it on credit. And of course, construction companies were selling on credit. Okay. How does it work? You put in 10% down payments and you got it sold. Well, we get it sold when, you know, actually it's constructed. Mm -hmm. But you put in 5% a year and a half ago, by now the price has fallen by 25%. What's the smart thing to do? Well, we call it sunk cost. You paid it already anyway or not. So right now the decision is, are you getting the price? Are you paying the price above the market price or below the market price? In other words, whether you put 5 or 10% is irrelevant, alright? So say, oh, price has fallen 20%. You might as well walk away from your deposit completely because the price has fallen by 20%. In other words, you promised to pay $300,000, you put in $10,000 as a down payment, now you got to pay up to ninety, dollars but the price already has fallen to two hundred and fifty. dollars You got to be playing dumb to pay two ninety dollars when the market price is two fifty, dollars right? So what is now happening is people are walking out Walking out means they abandon their deposit, they lose the deposit, and suddenly the seller is stuck with the property and unable to sell it. Why? Because they did not account for the cyclical variation. So, it's very important also, cyclical variations can provide biases. In other words, everyone in Bulgaria or in Dubai was thinking that construction will grow up by 10% and the prices will grow by 15% based on the trends but they did not account that they were in the boom phase of the cycle and when the bust comes they will be busted, right? Go bankrupt. So essentially that's very important. You also get these seasonalities. I don't want to uh, discuss uh, these. So they shift, this is it, the trend line up as in the boom time. You estimate uh, residential prices in Dubai 2000 and Y, 
2001, 2007, and the long-term trend line will be artificially shifted up because you're picking up only the boom phase of the market. Of course, when you pick up the uh, bust phase only, it's going to be actually negative, all right? And the overall will be a little bit uh, not as steep as the boom. <laughs> All right, so, so you also have to account for particular seasonality. In other words, in Bulgaria, uh, during the boom times, January and February sales of real estate will just collapse. And, you know, they're just going to fall by 50%. And no businessman will get worried. Why? Because they know last year's sales were down 50% during January and February. Two years ago, they were down 50%. Five years ago, they were down 50%. Why? Why in January, uh, real estate prices are down, uh, sorry, sales, transactions are down 50%? Two simple reasons. People are spent out during Christmas. They did the wild and crazy spending during December. They don't have the money for a down payment in January. That's number one. Number two, Bulgaria means you're going to be walking in the snow like this and nobody wants to, you know, go and drive around all sorts of places like construction areas where it's dirt, mud, slush and everything else. Just people, you know, stay at home in warm weather, uh, warm, you know, and they just don't want to get out anywhere. So, uh, everybody just abandons uh, the shopping for real estate and apartments during January and February. It is widely recognized and no one is worried because sales fall 50%. All right? Let's see what else. Uh, oh, experiment. Wow. <laughs> it worked. So, uh, sales with seasonal variation, this is what it is, and uh, a picture is like this. You take one, two, three, four. Yeah. If you take only these four, uh, kind of see how my hand will show you the trend, might look like this, yeah. but it's not. Of course, you see one, two, three, four, the trend might look like this, but obviously you can see it is not. Actually, the trend is like this for the week months, and this is for the trend for the strong months, all right? So the way we handle this is with a, the way we handle this is with a dummy variable. Let's see how NFT is going to show. All right, so to account for seasonality, you add up dummy variables. If you have only one season, you add one dummy variable. For example, in Bulgaria, you will have normal tourist seasons, and then you have the July-August peak. So for the July-August peak, you're going to add a special variable, maybe, to account for the price, where the price will be three times higher than off uh, the season. So each dummy variable accounts for one particular time period. So what I did was show you off-season and season. So I show you only two seasons, when I have two seasons, you need one dummy variable to account for two seasons. If you have four seasons, four, uh, you know, spring, summer, etc., etc., you need three dummy variables to account for four seasons, all right? In other words, one will be fixed, one will be fixed, and the other three will be uh, using dummy variables to provide the offset. So, if you have uh, let's say seasonal monthly data. One level for January, one for February, one for September, one for December. If you have 12 months and you want for each month to have a separate seasonal variable, seasonal dummy variable, you need 11, you need 11 dummy variables to account for 12 months. In other words, for uh, monthly seasonality. In other words, we can call it uh, uh, we can call it quarterly seasonality in terms of sales. Quarterly refers to three months. You can call it monthly seasonality, as if you have twelve seasons. In other words, one for each month of the year. Or you can have just uh, one season, like the summer peak season, kind of like peak season, and we call it off season. So, if you have N seasons, 
you need n minus one dummy variables. All right, and that's pretty much it. Let's try it again. Wow, this is fun. Uh, did it change? No. Is it done? No, we have to. Oh yeah. Okay. So effects of seasonality. Uh, this shows you the seasonality of off season and peak season. Mm -hmm. So this represents the off season and represents the off season long term trends. So it's going to be like this. Uh, you got to kind of now watch my fingers. Off season, off season, off season, peak season. Uh, uh oh, <laughs> no. So again, off, 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 peak. Again, off, 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 peak. Again, off, 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 peak. Off, 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 peak. So this will be the logic of this, and this is what the chart was presenting. And it looks like you see this one doesn't work when you want it. Oh. <laughs> All right, so. What are the final warnings? In other words, I am basically done with this chapter. So, which are the basic warnings that you have to be aware of? Warning number one is trying to predict too far into the future is a dangerous and risky exercise subject to increasing errors. In other words, predicting anything for next month is fairly decent, but predicting anything three years or nine years down the road is extremely difficult. Also, predicting one month out, you can do with certain degree of confidence. In other words, your error will be fairly small. Predicting you know, car sales four years out could be extremely difficult. So, as you forecast further into the future, your forecasting error must necessarily increase because the further into the future, the higher the risk and the higher the uncertainty. Just because this is the nature of business. The nature of time is that the farther out, the riskier it is for anything in life, not just in business. Second one is you have to be extremely careful of model misspecification. Specification refers to the functional choice, whether it's linear, log linear, or some other functional choice. Specification refers to the choice of variable. You add up the Levi's, you add up some other brand names, you also add the season, you add a whole bunch of things. So, specification refers to the, also to the choice of variables. So, you got to add the season, you also got to add the income of people. If people's income are rising, they're going to be buying more gaps. If the income is falling, they aren't going to be buying a lot of pants. They're just going to be wearing the older uh, pants. So, uh, misspecification is an error or mistake in the specification, in other words, in the choice of functional form and in the choice of variables. If you misspecify, you can get a whole bunch of statistical problems like biases, incorrect errors and incorrect mistakes, uh, etc. It reduces the liability of the forecast, etc. Etc. In other words, when you are relying on statistical models, you got to be alert to misspecification errors. Uh, and the final one, which of course is the most difficult, of course this is exactly what we are observing in the last 6 or 12 months, is all of these models capture a particular structure. All of these models, for example, capture the boom time of real estate in Dubai or in Bulgaria or in America, assuming that the boom times will continue during the forecast. Well, if there is a structural change, what means structural change? Means the banking system is in crisis and they stop lending. Suddenly, the whole real estate model, which we have modeled so far, just collapses, is no longer valid. 
So, an, so that will be one example. Another example is you've modeled a whole bunch of things on the economy or whatnot, or imports and exports of cars and everything else. The currency crashes and all bets are off. In other words, US dollar crashes, imports prices double if the dollar falls in half, right? The import prices double. So suddenly, you are meaning somebody, the Japanese Toyota, what not have been modeling how many cars they're going to ex export to the United States in a fairly weakening economy. But they have been implicitly assuming that the dollar is stable. Well, they haven't accounted for 30 or 50 percent crash in the dollar. Well, once you, the dollar crashes, the whole system is fundamentally different. The whole U.S. economy will, be, will begin to switch in a completely different regime. So, uh, in other words, if you are forecasting something into the future or analyzing, you are assuming that there has been a certain structure you assume that the structure was fairly not changing over that time and you assume that for the next forecast, for the foreseeable future, the forecast will remain, sorry, the structure will remain the same. But in reality, this is not the case. In other words, you always need a separate analysis to provide for structural changes like if you're in the real estate business you can't just assume that the lending will go on like it has been over the last 10 years if a country runs current account uh, deficits like Bulgaria or America or Great Britain you can't assume that the currency will remain stable in the long run for the Saudis uh, Saudis are running current account surpluses it will be a fundamental mistake to assume that the Saudi Rial will stay as stable as before because it has to appreciate. If it doesn't appreciate, there will be other collateral damages. So, proper modeling for the longer term should allow for potential appreciation. In other words, a break from the dollar peg or revaluation to the dollar. Any revaluation to the real of the real to the dollar, as is the Bulgarian lev to the euro, is a fundamental structural change which will affect the whole economy from interest rates to prices to export prices to import prices to cost to everything for Saudi Arabia, including the cost of labor on top of capital, on top of reserves and everything else. So these are some of the things too. And it's